So I changed the Asun was the title was a little bit vague because I was a little bit in a hurry. And uh, so I started with observing that although it's a very wide spectrum of the subject covered by this meeting, it doesn't cover all the work by Thomas. And I think the most cited his paper is on symplectic geometry, which actually in all textbooks now in symplectic geometry, about classification of torical symplectic manifolds, yeah? Which is quite quite a nice quite a nice theorem. I say, but we don't, we don't touch it here, right? And my point is exactly indicate the relation between two aspects of this meeting, negative curvature and Kelly manifolds. And the problem here it is a problem. So so we given a group and it may be not any group, you always can find count the example if you do it too broadly, but group with some with some niceness to that, or at least without apparent pathologists, and you want to construct a geometric object out of the group where essentially this group is, is fundamental group, but something like that, right? It, you know, it, it's a, a classical number theory. It was and probably still famous problem to, to, to realize a given final group as a Galois group of extension of a cube, right? This is not like that, but so this re realization of a group in a nice way. And nice here is, as I indicated, Uh, okay, but this will happen. How, how it is to move it? With the arrows in the flesh. Okay, when I do that, it divides, you see. It's supposed to divide, yeah? You, can you see it like that? Okay, that sounds uh, okay. Yes. Me. And so it might be kind of canonical construction, preferably in terms of the group, or some extra structure in the group still describe group theoretically. And it must be universal or classifying that if you take other object in a similar way related, all of them will be induced from that. Similar how a classifying space of a, of a group in general classifies all, all spaces with this fundamental group and maps it into there, right? Like k by one spaces. And uh, so there are two examples which kind of somewhat inspiring. And one of the classical theorem of Abel, Jacobi, Albanese, I don't know whom, is A, and it says it works very well in the Diabetian case. That the fundamental theorem, if you have a algebraic manifold or Kelly manifold, compact Kelly manifold, and you have a homomorphism, isomorphism of its it's homology more torsion to the homology of the of a complex of a torus, therefore it must be of the right dimension. Then it comes from a holomorphic map, but this holomorphic map, holomorphic map is very kind of a rare animal. This homomorphism are multiple, it's kind of easy, easy thing, but having, having it covered from complex geometry is quite amazing, and it is kind of a theorem, and so except that this complex structure on the torus depends on your manifold and it's essentially unique. It's unique structure in the map essentially unique upper translations. So it's completely canonical, right? So you can out of the group, you make this family of Kelly manifolds, and this is a modular spaces of all this. We have to polarize them, yes, the technicalities of this complex, complex tori, and then they represent all manifolds with this fundamental group in a very kind of nice way. And so, it's so kind of, we say, okay, it's one of the most famous theorem in mathematics. Is it due, due to who? Well, it's called Abel, Jacobi, Albanese, I don't know. I don't know who actually proved it, as usual, it's unknown. It's classical of, of, of the 19th century. But it has one, if you're kind of novice and kind of, but you know how to ask nasty questions, you say, are there any examples? That's an interesting point, because of course there are curves. In the algebraic curve, for every curve there is a Jacobian, and this is a classical construction. There are many specific constructions. How you make Jacobian complex stories out of the curve, right? Analytically, purely algebraic, or any field, ta ta Though for algebraic manifolds, for Keller, it, it doesn't, uh, but this is not a, not a kind of Keller stuff, it's pure algebraic. 
But then if you look at the higher dimensions and ask, what are example? Can you give me manifold? Kelly manifolds with a, with a given kind of non-trivial H1, which is not like product of curves and uh, abelian varieties. And you say, well, well if you know, know a little bit, you can say, ah, take this co uh, co complex torus, algebraic torus, and take, say, hyperplane section or generic section. But then it will be there from the statue, yeah? And so it's not solved this, yeah? Actually, algebraic geometry is a kind of cheater. So they say algebraic manifold defines, you know, by equation, try to time complex projection space. You say these words, are there any examples? No. no. It's extremely hard to compute, produce. Yeah? They don't come easily, right? So I would say that it may be kind of overstatement, but no, nobody has any idea what algebraic manifolds are. What are they? Are? Because there are this naive complex intersection, there are modular spaces, then there are something I will mention, arithmetic varieties coming from discrete groups, and then maybe one, two, and then you very few sources of them. So we don't know. And there are conjectures, classical conjectures. I'm not certain how much of them are solved, that up to some extent there is nothing else in certain, in certain cases. And so, however, it's still a great theorem. And the core of the theorem is the case of the curves and my kind of quick skepticism about high dimension not completely unjustified because the general case trivially more or less follows from the case of curves. For at least for algebraic varieties, for pro complex projects of algebraic manifolds. In the following way, because, so, given this homomorphism of groups, and this is from topology, we know there is a continuous map implementing this homomorphism, but continuous, and it defines up to homotopy. And then, on the other hand, your algebraic variety is built out of curves, yeah? Take, say, you have surface, you take pencil, right? You take some point and rotate plane around it, and you have this family of curves, which meet at one point. For each of these curves, you know there's a complex structure on the torus, and holomorphic map was there by this theorem. But at this point, they may disagree. Of course, it doesn't give you. However, if they don't disagree, it gives you a map from this point, with a rational map, a rational curve, to this modular space. But this modular space, you know, is simply connected. I mean, it's universal covering quality, but you don't have to think about complex structure. It's just simply connected. So it cannot contain any rational, rational curves. So that's, and this point, I want to elaborate la later on, yeah? So the key of all that and all, all generalization is apparently what happens to curves, and this is very similar so how we can think about hyperbolicity in group theory, right? It may be, you may think in terms of surfaces or in terms of curves, and there are kind of two pa parallel languages. But this is on the holomorphic side. But, and, but what's remarkable, and this is less known, though it's more elementary and equally beautiful theorem, due in this form John Franks, who actually proven quite a few other theorems. And this is for dynamical systems. Now, instead of a complex Keller manifold, you take a manifold, or kind of any reasonable space, compact, con locally contractible space, with a, a, a automorphism, self-homeomorphism. So this self-homeomorphism replaces a complex structure. So a complex structure was endomorphism of the tension bundle, multiplication by square root of one one. And here just manifold itself. <laughs> transformed to itself. And I think there is a kind of much closer relation, but on the surface of things, you see, it's a completely identical statement, right? And then there is homomorphism from H1 of your manifold to H1 of the torus. And then on the torus, there we needed Keller. Here, instead of Keller, we say this automorphism induces hyperbolic automorphism on H1, which means it's kind of generic. There is no eigenvalue by absolute value equal one. So it either stretches some vector or contracts it. No vector kind of goes unchanged. Of course, there might be an important element we should, which we don't want to. And then the same theorem is true. On this torus, there is unique, also automorphism, but it will be automorphism of the torus. 
And again, essentially unique, again, unique after translation. Here you might be slightly more careful, less some time and maybe more, more constraint. Continuous map which preserves the structure, meaning commuting with this endomorphism. So this is kind of simple theorem, but what I want to say about that. Uh, yes, historically, it has kind of history how people arrived at this. John Franks, who finally founded the, but the first precursor of this was Smale, who I think in nine, about 62 announced stability of hyperbolic automorphism of the two torus. And then he announced it, I think somewhere, it's a meeting in Moscow, and when he left, soon thereafter, Arnold and Sinai published the paper giving the proof. And then, Smail was kind of referring to that at some point, and said that there is proof here and there, but the, the proof by, by Arnold and Sinai has an advantage of being published. And this is quoted in the paper by Anosov, who said, and adds, but at, at one disadvantage. A disadvantage is being complete nonsense. <laughs> yes, not just wrong, just nonsensical. <laughs> yeah? Was yeah, absolutely no proof. <laughs> yes, was wrong is yes. Right. So, this theorem of Frank's, its proof it implies that much by code, by order of magnitude, more powerful theorem. If you say it correctly, it takes five lines. And this, all these proofs are quite long, yeah? And then an author worked out some proof of stability. It was first kind of correct published proof. But then it was realized that no stability is much stronger theorem. It's no stability when perturbed diffeomorphism, whatever. You take any transformation in different space, only remember about H1, and then reconstruct your map. And it's unique reconstruction. And, it's, and when in dynamics people apply it to the torus itself, in, in use the word type semi-stability or something. Well, because you see, but in, in certain quarters, still people think, oh, there are structures and there are isomorphisms. But, uh, but from certain, but it will from, from here and, and uh, kind of, kind of thinking of growth and dick, we know it's kind of minor, isomorphism minor, kind of small potato game, there are morphisms. They call this category, and there things happen. Isomorphism is just a little, little guy there. Yeah, important, but little. Still not leading. And this is where theorem is. It is really categorical theorem. And so yeah, I just say a couple of words about that. So, and so the point is what? How far this goes? How far this analogy goes? How th close are things related? At the very beginning, I said, when you look at the module already, is complex polarized, c c complex tori. They already give you fantastic this manifold of non-positive curvature in vector bundle over it and a gr group action, semi-direct product. And the same automorphism which acts here on the torus appears there in the definition of modular space because on the modular space, on the story, you have all these monodromy elements acting, in which some of them hyperbolic and some, of course, non-hyperbolic, majority are hyperbolic. So this thing is closely related, but on one hand. On the other hand, there is parallel story, and so the logic is as follows. That you look at something in, in one field, and you, you know some little theorems or conjectures, and then you look what happens in the parallel one, and then you usually have conjectures. Yeah. So, so it's a way to generate conjectures either about Kähler manifolds and their fundamental groups, or about dynamical systems or hyperbolic structure, hyperbolic dynamical system, or not on the system. Hyperbolic groups in the second will be in this, in this box together. With uh, hyperbolic and the uh, automorphism of tori. So, so what comes next? Uh. Oh, excuse me. And uh, so how you do it in this Frank's theorem? So what is the uh, key concept? And this concept was coming from the work of Smale. And, ah, by the way, you see uh, what I failed to say. Why this picture? Yeah. So why, why this picture came from? So, so who, who knows what it is? Uh, uh, yeah, no, no, what is the, 
what it has to do with hyperbolic dynamics? <laughs> ah, horseshoe, absolutely. It's horseshoe shaped waterfall. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's where hyperbolicity and dynamics was first kind of pinpointed, I think, by, 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 by Steve Smale. Yeah. So it's horseshoe. Because see, just uh, what I'm telling, so maybe I can go to the very end. Yeah, so there are, there are, refer there are references of how it didn't make them big, yeah. Right, I quote three papers and I wrote myself some. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I put huge yeah, uh, parentheses to earlier. And uh, exactly about the matters I'm talking now. And so nobody read the article. And now I just read it and tried to explain it and found out it's very hard to read, yeah. I had difficulty reading it, but I so little understood from this I'm telling you. Well, but, uh, but definitely, uh, just I pinpointed quite a few points, uh, interesting observations there, and one of them motivated by the work by Toledo, uh, to, to whose, whose contribution will come in a, in a short while. So coming back. So, so orbits and quasi orbits. So when you have an action of a group somewhere, and we can, it doesn't have to be a group, just set of transformation. It will be generating set of transformation. An orbit meaning you have a map from your group or semi-group to the space, such that it's compatible with action on these elements, right? So you have finitely many elements, which are generating sets finite, and you have a group itself, x from one side, from the left or from the right. I, I cannot say, when I say this word, I, say, so it's, I don't know what it means, yeah? You know what means left or right? No, no, it's not a joke. You basically communicate with somebody along the long way, say along uh, what, left or right. So what is, how you can explain it? You know, there's only one explanation. I know only one, but you know a second. You know what? Where left, t t t t from right. It's a weak, in the weak interaction, yeah? This particular, you know, nuclear decay when left and right slightly different. So you have to know details of that. If you don't know that, don't say these words. And I don't quite know the details of the experiment, neither Lee Young logic, so I don't say left and right, because you have to be responsible for what you say. In mathematicians are mostly responsible for scientists, because they don't refer to the real world. They speak about their intuition, right? Which is certainly least reliable of all, kind of, of all measurable inst instruments we have. So, so it, it acts somehow, somewhere. Right from, from some side, whichever it is. On the other hand, X in the space, and these two actions must commute. But if they commute up to by an error, so if you commute here and here in the infinite error, it's quasi orbit if it's finite. If it's epsilon small, it's epsilon small, very small. And so these are orbit are quasi orbits. And how you construct your, in the case of a space, it acts by the homeomorphism, and you want to build up the torus with an action in a canonical way, what you do, you go to universal covering, and then action of the finally generating set, in, in, your, in, in this case it's one element, yeah, and it's in the verse if you want, acts on the space, they act on that, right, and so there are orbits and in any action time you approximated by, by corresponding sequence in the group, this will be quasi orbit. And then this remarkable thing, every quasi orbit is followed by a unique orbit, right? The shadowing principle. Why so? And this is exactly as in, in geometry, because for orbits, for actual orbits, distance between two orbits is concave function. Yeah. Some way they close and then they diverge in a very sharp way. So it is a stably concave or convex function. I don't know how, how it's called convex. Yeah. And just once it's being observed for this action, okay, you have this theorem with all its consequences, and it's quite, quite simple. However, the, the, there is a, another way to approach that. And this was in classical dynamical system of a north of smell, real, and how you define them in this final way which can be done in a more formal method without appeal to a group or to universal covering, 
but it has kind of on the partial power of what I'm going to say. So instead of saying this universality for which you need have concept of a covering or something like covering, and so just bounded error without specifying by how much, it will be just epsilon bounded and epsilon will be small depending on the situation. So how to describe in a dynamical system in a kind of what about the simplest dynamical systems huh? on compact spaces. So we have uh, going to describe. And you see the simplest system will be uh, the one which I'm going to describe will be this what I call Markov hyperbolic. They're almost the same as hyperbolic, but not quite. Uh, there is slightly slightly more general, but to the full extent I am not quite quite certain how, how, by how much. So number one, dynamical system for any group. It is a Bernoulli shift. You can see the function from your group to your finite set. Right? And this is a compact Cantor space. And then you're in a group like there. Quite simple. And then you say, aha, you can, you can take subset there. So you take some, in the group, you take some finite region and say, I only allow particular function there. When they restrict to this set on all the shift, I want to be in a certain subset of all functions. So I, I impose finitely many conditions. And then I have what is called Markov shift. In, 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 in combinatorial terms, it means you have a directed graph, and it is easily reduced to that, and your system consists of all maps of infinite graph and uh, well, in infinite, infinite paths going along the line, and then transformation just shift. Right? And so yes, because you don't take the full graph, you don't allow all positions. That's OK. But this is Markov systems, and they also canter. But now we have something like torus. In the torus, you have a syndomorphism. There is apparently no canter set. And then you can reduce to that. And this is reminiscent, but I'm, you know, what I'm saying now, unfortunately, unfortunately, there is nobody who knows that. There was this recent, recent wave of ideas called going under the name of condensed spaces. Uh, implemented by Scholz and his collaborator, I've forgotten his name, when they describe continuous objects in terms of category of essentially counter spaces over the subject. Right? And then, in particular, they were describing uh, in this kind of fairly, fairly al al algebraic way, and you know, because counter says are the projective limits of finite sets. So you can, the standard way is by using the Markov partitions. No, 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 no. This, of course, my Markov partition, I agree with you. Of course, Markov partition gives you slightly more. Yes. The point is that what, what I'm saying, listen, what I'm saying makes sense for any group where there is no Markov partitions. Indeed, traditionally, actually, before that, even by, before Markov partition, it was used by an author using this covering by smell. Then I'll come back. Markov partition is something else which is related to that, absolutely. But what I'm saying, there is a much more kind of highbrow thinking along possibly similar line that very many continuous objects describable as categories of particular categories of profinite sets, right? And here, from this point of view, you replace your dynamical system by a general dynamical system, by all Markov system over it. So those for which are this quotient and all kind of diagrams which commute with this quotient map. And this is a, a very much how it goes. And so this is now the definition. So what's the definition? So you want to represent your dynamical system as a quotient of a Markov system, which is zero dimensional. You know, any topological space quotient, oh, compact Hausdorff space is quotient of a of counter set. But you can do it together with dynamics. You can say that, but that's not a big deal, yeah? It's not so interesting. So what's interesting is that the relation which defines it. So you have a quotient space. So it, it says you have binary relation on your original space. So you have a Markov space. Forget about this Markov, that Bernoulli shift. And then you identify certain orbits. And how you do that? You identify them again by a Markov rule. You can see the system by itself, times itself. Now it's an X 
on a product of space by itself. And again, you identify pairs if this identification given on pairs or, or, on finite sets. Right? So on each finite set, you take this binary relation, generate corresponding relation on infinite, infinite sequences, and they say, aha, I want it to be equivalent relation. It's extremely strong condition. And miraculous is the right examples. So, 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 so it's not for one parameter of an analytical system. When you have groups, yeah, is this it makes sense for any group? This is any semigroup. Yeah. Huh? For any semigroup. Now, already for dynamical system, it gives you the following way of representing them, very much in spirit of small cancellation theory. On one hand, you have a graph, this directed graph, and then you identify finite pieces of the orbit. So there are this segment and this segment, and you attach square to this, and to this segment and to this segment you attach square. This gives you binary relation and, of, and say two sequences, two strings equivalent. If any time they pass here, they satisfy this relation. What you get will be not in general equivalence relation. You can span equivalence relation, but then you have non-Hausdorff space. You have very uh, ugly space. But miraculously, there are examples. Conjecture. Uh, this, there is nothing else but this miracle. All these conjectures kind of have kind of fancy, fancy name of rigidity theorems. You have a miracle, and then you say, aha, it doesn't repeat itself. And it's called the rigidity theorem. First, it was very exciting. People were proving most of rigidity, were good arithmetic, ta, ta, ta. At some moment, I think it's a ball. Right. Of course, we have miraculously kind of tight object. It's very unlikely it, it appears twice. Yeah? But, but here, have, however, it's unknown. And conjecture is here is going, in a way, going back to smell in a special form, saying that if you have such a, such a system and resulting space is a manifold, then it will be one of the classical examples. It will be endomorphism, infinite manifold, or, or something of, of the kind. On the other hand, I guess, genetically, you have a huge amount of such system where the phase space will be solenoid. It will be counter set times line or something. And then, and there might be kind of parallel theory, like small cancellation theory, where in small cancellation theory, you describe a body group where the boundary one dimensional, and here it will be a similar thing. It will be generic dynamical system, generic such combinatorial scheme will give you such. And this is, none of this is known. And there are a score of problems which is unknown here, and I just mentioned like only one of them. But this concerns that. And this kind of more or less rethinking of the classical conjectures of, of 50 or 60 years ago development by Smail, Anosov, Bowen, and other people on, on hyperbolic dynamics. But now what about other groups? So the example, when the first definition appeared, there was only uh, one example, and these were boundary of hyperbolic groups. The boundary of hyperbolic groups also like that. And they can be described exactly in, this, in a similar way. You can see that on the hyperbolic group, kind of your, the, the map to the space of self-mapping of the balls or something. It describes it easily described. In a way, you know that it's mark of presentation of the of the the boundary. By the way, it's referring to a question about mark of partitions. Indeed, so mark of partition in this context means that this quotient map is finite to one. And it's and the proof kind of extremely neat and pleasant because of you artificially order some elements in the graph and using this to prove it. And, and exactly the, 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 what is wrong, you don't uh, work in the right category. So this categorical thinking which I mentioned, categorical description, is just a dream. It was not implemented as a tool to prove theorems. When, because eventually when I think if, if it develop, it will be by, by, uh, by order of profound theory of, of ballistry. And now we're coming to, you know, coming to the general case. And so one example of that. But then, yes, when I was writing this article, I just realized there's another nice class of examples. Namely, if you take any semi-simple Lie group, we satisfy Margulis rigidity theorem, or Nitisti. So you have to throw away, throw away the, you know, the real, real complex hyperbolic spaces as a factors. 
They have this Lie group, semi-simple Lie group, say simple Lie group, divided by compact, by, com by co-compact lattice. Then the action of this lattice and this group has this universality property. The action of what? You, you, you take semi-simple Lie group, yes. divided by, by, by gamma. And, and then gamma acts there from another side. Right? But this action has this universality property. Which means, if you take this group, and it acts anywhere else, and this anywhere else, you have a homomorphism from this universal from the fundamental group here, commuting with this action, then there is unique, essentially unique, continuous map implementing that. So, and, and the proof, quite simple, modular, okay, no, no, no result by, on, on rigidity, partly by Pansu, and then by Kleiner with, uh, what, whom? that this actually is a consequence of, of quasi-asymmetric rigidity of these corresponding spaces. And then, it's, well, there are other examples you can, you can make, but still it's unknown. If you have just torus, and there is a subgroup of automorphisms of the torus, a discrete subgroup, which of them have this property? Some of them do, some of them don't. And this is one of the questions which is unclear, and in general, for this group, and so in, in terms of the group, this orbit and quasi orbit, the, what acts in the group? In terms of the group, is an inner automorphism. So the group of inner automorphism may have this property that quasi orbits are uniquely followed by orbits. But this orbit now represents elements in the Lie group enveloping this group. However, this is not the final story because what you get topological structure, how you can get geometric structure in terms of the group. And this is a not quite clear to I me mean, in full generality, though I, I think I know what it is, but uh, I can indicate it is definitely so. It's canonically constructible, we know it a posteriori. But, uh, but and there is the following way to think about that, which you can see, strangely enough, most clearly in the case where there is no this rigidity, namely in the real hyperbolic case. Now, you have a real hyperbolic space. So, so you divide by co compact lattice, or even by. by Finite covolume lattice. How we can reconstruct out of the group? How we can reconstruct the space? This is geometry. Everywhere except, of course, for dimension two. Where in dimension two there are moduli, it's three k. It's not that you have to throw it away, but it requires more thinking. Starting with dimension three. So what you do? You reconstruct the boundary. You know the boundary, topologically. It's reconstructable from the group, as I said. But then, what you have extra? In your space, you have this, if it's compact, if it's non-compact, you might be careful to say it, you have distinguished homology class. You have fundamental homology class of your manifold, right? So you have fundamental homology class. And this class is bounded. In, so, in some way, it is represented by measure in the space of simplices, which representing this class of measure is uh, actually bounded. And this is extremal one. An extremal one some supported on a regular simplices at infinity. And once you have them, you can reconstruct the full structure. So you have a sphere at infinity, you have topological sphere, and you have distinguished configuration of points corresponding to regular simplices, and this reconstructs all geometry. And the same, nowadays we know that the same truth for all lo locally symmetric spaces, the fundamental class bounded, there is a distinguished measure, and this measure at infinity, I think, reconstructs all geometry at infinity, teach geometry at everything. But I never worked it out. It's hardly questionable. However, still, they are very special examples. So the question is how we can go further. And so what will be the next step? So what do we have to time? <laughs> Not that I have much time. Because I wanted to say something to turn to the complex geometry, it what goes along, yeah. So, so I say just two words, says there are some indication, an instance of a theorem. So, there are two basic theorems there. One of the Grauer theorem, it says its solution on Levy, on, on, on Levy problem, and it's properly interpreted. It tells us something about Kelly and the men's group. Then there is theorem by Sue. I, together they imply just it gives a clear corollary. I indicate some corollary that. What, what does he say? Schuh's theorem? Schuh's theorem says, 
in this, in this special case, if you have a Kelly manifold, compact Kelly manifold, and it maps to the, say, compact, compact manifold with complex algebraic geometry, with a co complex hyperbolic space divided by co compact lattice, and you have a map which is a rank, at least real rank map, more than two. Then the map is homotopic to holomorphic or anti holomorphic map. A Grauer theorem said that if you have a pseudo convex manifold with pseudo convex boundary, then all cycles above middle dimension are realizable by complex of manifolds. This, uh, this is Grauer's great theorem because you have very soft conditional convexity of the boundary and that give you uh, cycles. And cycles, as you know, in algebraic geometry, really they function origin. As I said, you Producing algebraic variety is just to produce interesting algebraic variety. You have to secretly solve some definition problem, which may or may not be solvable. Yeah, they shouldn't be there, right? Most of them. But this gives you me me a soft mechanism generating them. Not that I truly understand all implications. Proof is easy. Implication I never thought to, but this one corollary combining the two, saying they're related. And then maybe I say just one word. All of this construction, which I can, uh, know, uh, are associated with some distinguished cycles. For example, a manifold, fundamental, we have a group where there is top dimensional homology class, and this class organizes your geometry. Or it may be some other homology class. And then there is an issue what are these high dimensional homology? And this is very tricky, because we have a, the fact that there are groups where there are ample ample kind of high dimensional rational homologies, forget about torsion. torsion, of course, you can a lot with final groups. But in general, it's very hard to produce specific examples of groups with in interesting homology. Again, you start making example one, two, three, and then you run, run pretty fast, run out of examples. And here is a conjecture, so because I was speaking about problems, which related to that, and is one of the rather actively studied problems these days, which is a version of the Novikov conjecture about high signatures. So Novikov conjecture itself is purely algebraic and says that homology of the group, of any group, which can probably conjecture probably wrong, it's too general to be, to be true, is expressible in terms of, roughly speaking, in terms of quadratic forms of a group ring of the group. Well, I don't want to formulate more precisely, but essentially what it says. And geometric counterpart of that, which is, again, there is no counterexample for the moment, but probably it's not true, says uh, the following, which I formulate in a very special case. Namely, when you have a spherical Riemannian manifold. So you have compact, probably with a boundary, a spherical Riemannian manifold. So universal covering, contractible. So all I know. And then conjecture says, a very kind of geometric conjecture related in a rather tricky way, which takes time to explain to what I'm saying before, is as follows. That if I take any complex vector bundle over this, then if I take, if I add it to itself sufficiently many times, then it admits, and uh, given an epsilon, then I can take some of the bundle with itself. So in K theory, I multiply it by, by big integer. Then the resulting bundle admits unitary connection where curvature will be everywhere point-wise less than my epsilon. So every element of uh, uh, rational case theory implemented by a most flat bundle. And this is a, it's not as general as the Noigo conjecture, but much, most, uh, much stronger you know, uh, would, would relate to that. But it, it takes some time to explain what it has to do with what I said before about structure of this, structure of this cycle. And again, just it's infinity of question comes from be playing back and forth between these two, two domains. And I didn't say what was the essential part, and this you can find in, my in, in paper by Toledo in, in mine, about Toledo hyperbolicity, how you can uh, reformulate and reprove the few theorems in you know, this kind of hyperbolic type, type of language very similar to how it works in dynamics and in manifolds, in geometry of manifolds of negative curvature. But I have to stop. Right, at 45 minutes, right? Yes. So, I'm <laughs> I, I, I have three minutes. 
Yes. Ah, I have three minutes. Oh. You, you have more than three minutes. You started at a quarter. Ah, okay, okay, okay. You still, you still have 15 minutes. Uh, I have 15 minutes. Oh, great. Oh. Okay, so let me say what is relation between this making of the structures via simplicial volume and the Noikov conjecture. So I want to give yet another question which is related to two. So, when I speak about simplicial volume of a manifold, or any homology class, but say fundamental class of a manifold, so what you do? You look at all pseudo manifolds. When I say pseudo, pseudo, pseudo manifolds, meaning ori oriented pseudo manifold, dimension equal to a manifold, in map to my manifold. And, and then you see how many simplices are there, and divide by d the degree of the map. Right? So, for any manifold, I consider all the pseudo manifold map there and take a degree of, the, of each map and divide the number of symbols by degree. And then minimize this number and go up to infinity when d goes to infinity. So you have a number. For most manifolds, simply connect to get zero. But for interesting manifolds, it's non zero, it's a number. And this is an invariant of your manifold, topological invariant. And it's quite not obvious that there's this invariant ever non zero. But apparently, it's non zero for very, very general class of cases. On one hand, but, but just not covering, just delivering. Just, just, just not, not covering would be kind of pp kind of peanuts, yeah. Exactly, it's not covering any map. But now let's do the following. On one hand, we say instead of pseudo manifold, we say manifold. It seems kind of little difference, yeah. After all, any pseudo manifold, there is a manifold which goes there, with bounded degree by Tom theorem, but this degree. In Modification is significant. But now, instead of number of simplices needed for triangulating it, you take the minimal number of cells on a Morse function, minimal number of critical points on Morse function there, or the number of cells in cell decomposition. And also you have an invariant. And now, if you, if you look at the first invariant, then it's non-zero for all uh, locally symmetric space of negative type. If they compact space, universal covering is symmetric space with non, non negative curvature, you have without flat factors. This invariant non zero, which was I've forgotten recently proven in full generality. I'm sorry, I've forgotten the names. It was actually proven after I wrote this paper. I don't have it in my list of references. But on the other hand, if you take a manifold, on one hand you restrict class of object, but now you relax it and say, aha, instead of number of simplices, I just look at the number of cells in the cellular decomposition. And then the picture will be different. Because, again, for all even dimensional manifold of constant negative curvature, negative constant negative curvature, or complex hyperbolic spaces, or generally for all those locally symmetric manifolds with non-compact type, which have non-zero early characteristic, it's invariant non-zero, which is already non-trivial for product of two surfaces. Right? And on the other hand, if you take three-dimensional manifold, as we know, of course, it's false, yeah, because this manifold is essentially fiber over circle, and the fiber over circle, no matter how time, time, number of cells doesn't grow. And then that's all we know. Incredibly, we don't know nothing <coughs> more about this invariant, and it's certainly related to simplicity volume, and it's exactly at the core of this knowledge of conjecture. It's just, it's just kind of quantification of the knowledge of conjecture, because the proof of what I said, goes via index theorem applied to some twisted Dirac operators. There is no elementary proof of that, even for product of surfaces. For simplicial volume, the proof is elementary. You say geometry, simple system, kind of thrust and trick, etc. But there, it's the only proof is by index theorem. It would be a very kind of amazing thing, saying how much manifold differ from pseudo manifolds. And uh, so, uh, the question, of course, uh, about hyperbolic groups. For example, do all even dimensional manifold of negative curvature have this invariant on zero? Or it may be zero. Yes, we, even for very simple examples, we just cannot, cannot say. Because those which map to, to manifold of constant curvature, that's fine. But you know, there are very, very simple examples when the, on the, of, of a different kind. Even when the boundary is topological sphere of negative curvature, and 
they are not simply related to manifolds of constant curvature. There are kind of quite a variety of examples, and we don't know. So what happened there? Because the proof at some moment uses very special representation of the kind of dual Lie group to the semi corresponding semi simple Lie group uh, due to Lussig. So that's kind of question. So what are the questions are there? I was mentioning. So for, for Torai of even the region, I don't understand what's the number for. Uh, no, no, Torai, of course, is zero. Of course, zero. Of course, the Torai is zero. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, for Torai is zero. You take semi simple groups. Yeah. So, but yeah, said you said you wanted to be non zero? Yeah, no, no, of, of course, I'm asking. You, you, even, even the dimensional manifold of, of, of negative curvature. Kerala hyperbole. Hmm? No, it's unknown. I mean, it's, it's only known being non zero. If it is a locally symmetric space of non-compact type uh, with, 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 with discrete series, with non-zero early characteristic. So, so where it's obvious for covering, because early characteristic takes care of that. But it's true for all maps. And the first example, non-trivial example, it's product of surfaces. So where the, the proof, kind of you don't need your representation, just very, very simple representation, just at your hand. But still, you need index theorem. Or, actually, you can replace it in this particular case with some particular computation of a signature in coefficient in some, in some flat bundle. So it is a cosmological computation, but uh, it's a very kind of bizarre question that when we come to manifolds, say, of negative curvature, and we look at basic invariants, we, cannot, we don't know if they're zero or non-zero. Right? Another question, of course, which I mentioned for dynamical system, of course, appears for manifold, uh, or hyperbolic manifold where the boundary is spherical. So again, they're very limited for all we know, and they all may have rigid geometric structure behind them, but we don't know if it is true or not. So, so the groups, many groups seem go along with some very rigid geometric structure. However, we know little about that, and some structures, of course, are related directly or indirectly to locally to, to Lie groups. For example, we, we may start with manifold of constant curvature, and then say, take ramified covering or finite quotient, and still have interesting group O, make more complicated surgery. Out of them, we can build very, very many things, but they all come eventually from these locally symmetric objects. And the point is that we cannot produce directly interesting cycles of high dimensional group for high dimensional groups. Say the manifold of negative curvature is really very even non positive curvature, it's not so easy to produce. Say, they are there and but for them for, for example all these conjectures are known to be true. The cohomology are kind of simple in a way they're representable by almost flat bundles. So cohomology kind of group fully control control the the homology, which is in a way similar to what happens in algebraic geometry, where but, you know, if you think about a homology manifold in etal terms, it actually comes from, from, from a group homology of open the risky open sets. So if you know group homology of all the risky open sets and how one goes into another, all these errors, from that you build your etal homology or homology of the group according to Grothendieck. And the same picture appears here. So again, I think that there is no way to approach all this problem without really uh, uh, rethinking basic concepts, yeah, and making them more, more categorical, which is, of course, goes, we, we lag behind what happens when people doing algebraic geometry. But, for example, another question is, again, I cannot, which I can formulate very precisely, one of the properties of this hyperbolic dynamical system, Markov hyperbolic, defined combinatorially, is that the zeta function is rational. So the counting function is the number of periodic points. And because it defi defined combinatorially, you think there might be combinatorial proof. And, the, and, and moreover, everything indi indicates that there is this, not a function, but some kind of much more general object function in the variant category of graph or something like that, which have this rationality. However, the only proof which was found at some point by 
David Fried is actually repeating argument of these Markov partitions. So you reduce the system, repeat the argument, we should do partition, use the topological argument, and you cannot do it purely combinatorially. However, this purely combinatorial theorem, and actually about this comes categorical combinatorics, which we don't know, which we don't know how to do that. So, so there are the kind of infinite number of problems they just cannot, cannot, cannot uh, quite go through all of them. Yeah, I, you can look in my paper where it's written, and um, but maybe I emphasize again one simple and elementary problem. I, I, okay, okay. If, if I had some time, I can say uh, this, what I wanted to say about Toledo convexity. So, so see your theorem based on Bochner type formula. Bochner type formula for maps from manifold of Kelly from Kelly manifold to other manifolds. And this Bochner type formula rules out certain maps. This kind of local computation. However, there is another approach, close to what I indicated for how you reduce the curves in the case of Albanese, uh, Albanese theorem, how it reduces to classical Jacobi, Abel Jacobi theorem. You can look what happens to curves. And you observe that under curvature conditions where Sue theorem is, is true, the following more general property is true. If you consider a map from a curve, yes, from, 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 as a Riemannian manifold to another manifold, and observe first energy of the map is conformal invariant. So it's invariant of a complex structure. So, right, if you consider a Riemann surface, a Riemann meaning with Riemannian metric, you consider its space, of, uh, consider its maps to another manifold, and, and, and look at the Dirichlet energy of that. This energy depends only on, on conformal structure. So harmonic maps in minimum of this energy is conformal invariant. Therefore, becomes a function on the modular space of curves. So every Riemannian manifold and homotopic class of maps from in a homotopic class of maps from a given curve into there gives you a number. It is a minimum of the synergy on this, on this modulus with curves. This function, so it's, it's true for every complex structure, for any conformal structure. When you vary this, you have a function on the modulus space of curves. So every Riemannian manifold is an invariant now, and given these curves and homotopy class of maps, give you function on the modulus space. And this function is what is called pluridis subharmonic. So it's kind of convex in holomorphic sense. Its restriction to its restriction to any curve is harmonic, subharmonic, kind of con convex. And now we can forget about curvature, about complex structure, and you think this is a key property from which everything follows by rather simple arguments. And so in this very of the same spirit, as I said, what happens to orbits. So what characterizes the orbit of this way of the stability is that function between orbits have this convexity, this weak convexity. And this is a convexity in the complex sense, which unfortunately the theorem only true for closed surfaces. There is no counterpart for surface with boundary. If it were with a boundary, it will give you much more power, much more control about what happens. But still this kind of interesting and for particular geometries, besides those described in where it, it was observed first, I, I wonder why it's true. For example, if you take natural geometry on two-dimensional polyhedra, small cancellation group, whatever, you may have this property, and this will tell you something more that you usually get by other arguments. But this is certainly quite, quite, I think, basic concept in this theorem of Toledo. Uh, emerging from this theorem of Toledo. And the, the final, because I mentioned in, in my reference, I have another paper by Toledo which I received. Yes, it's the final. Yeah, it's the final paper by Toledo I received, I received a, a, a week ago. They eventually produced examples of algebraic manifolds, compact algebraic manifolds with negative curvature, which are not coming from the complex ball. And it was a long standing question. And the obvious candidate we are ramified covering of a totally geodesic submanifold. But to construct the ramified covering, you need to find a group. 
you have to, you, you have to know the corresponding group at some group of finite index. And they proved that the group is easily finite. And therefore, you have lots and lots and lots of manifolds of negative curvature, which are not coming from the ball, and they are Kelly and Moreau, they're complex algebraic. And this is pretty nice. It is expected, but still, it's a usual problem when you construct hyperbolic groups, but where it's construction, you're getting stuck because you don't know the group is really finite. And you construction don't go, like we find covering the related construction. And here they over, over, overcame this difference, which of course is shouldn't be there. I mean, in a way, the construction must go anyway, but in a, in a more general category, which is not at the moment well defined. So maybe yes. this may be Science. Yeah, this will be time, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Are there questions? No question. <laughs> How come? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, yes, uh, in the analog, in dynamical system, what is the analog of the modular space? So, so in the dynamical spaces, yeah, you have, y uh, you have your torus, and you have different an anamorphism, and so it's a group of automorphism of the torus, so it's a group of automorphism acting on this modular space. How we get modular space? Modular space of the tori is kind of locally symmetric space, mod gamma. And this gamma is a modular space for the dynamic system. Right, so they really coupled. They're kind of two parts of a general picture. So, so mo and on the case of the SU, there is no modular spaces. It's a map is just in the, because it's strictly a negative curvature, it's just any, it is only one structure. Space is rigid, right? And therefore, and this, by the way, are there are lots of questions related to that. Which of the space is rigid or not? Im immediate question appears when you have other manifolds. How you can get other manifolds with the same fundamental group? You just take a generic surface there. You take, take, you take you know, intersect with the plane of the right dimension. So it's, it's in, in high dimensional, the locally hyperbolic space, you have a surface. Of generic, it's completely, and then it, it can move. It's very movable. When you move it, of course, it has modular spaces. Conjecture is that the only module it has. Again, there is no algebraic geometry there. Maybe somebody knows it. So, but this again, according to this logic, there shouldn't be exterior, ex, ex, uh, extra, extra deformation. And this extra deformation is like ex external automorphism of the group, right? Like this high group of, of high symmetries, and like surface groups have no outer automorphisms. And here it corresponds, there is no outer deformations. So everything here is strangely enough counterpart there. You just say the word slightly different linguistically and you arrive at questions. Yeah? And again, this logic, uh, it's not fully kind of justified. Uh, example will say you must be careful. However, that's very interesting question, uh, algebraic geometry. What are modular spaces of this uh, hyper hyperplane section? of this complex algebraic varieties, and most likely uh, the modular space is exactly only the one which you get inside of the, there is no other deformations. Of course, I guess that it may be easily done by people who know, who know the ropes, how to do that. But then, when, once you have it, it has again some uh, good rigidity implication. Of course, it depends how you respect the rigidity theorems, yeah? You know, my respect for them kind of wane, but there are more and more and more of them in the overfield. But the, the question is to construct new objects, yeah, which is more, more interesting here. Thank you. More questions? Questions online? Mm, not seeing any question. any question online, no. Okay. I, I have a ah, question. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you mentioned several times this small consolation phenomenon for this... Model. For the dynamical system, right? Yeah, so uh, what kind of applications you... No, you can produce. So, 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 the question is, Using small cancellation or random groups, you know they're there. You do produce groups with certain properties, right? There, there are groups obtained by small cancellation, and these are groups in your hands about which you can prove something. There is no such effective description of this dynamical system, of this hyperbolic system, yeah? So, of course, it doesn't, wouldn't describe all of them, only this lower dimensional one, but, you, and, but, but they look Superficially, they organized exactly like small constellation groups, right? They are not groups; they kind of are like semi-groups because this, your graph is directed, and this kind of your two cells are also directed. So it's a two-dimensional complex with extra structure. It's much more rigid object, 
right? Because they could respond roughly not to hyperbolic group, but to solvable groups, so to speak, yeah? But the question is, we, well, I can say this verse, I'll give definition, but I cannot work out specific examples, look at the group, compute the entropies, etc. And this is kind of obvious thing to do, compute the, effectively compute the entropies, the zeta function, and uh, uh, it is a, it's a world of, uh, no, no, nobody looked uh, into. There's the definition, and that's it. And this somehow was for, for, forgotten by people with the dynamical system because they focus on smooth systems. And they're definitely non-smooth, right? And the problem which we left behind, the topological dynamics, beyond resources which exist at the moment, yeah? And in my view, we have to re redo the field in this more categorical way and then have a new perspective on that. It's something very, very old-fashioned. But the beauty of that, unlike kind of what is done in dynamical system, more classical, traditional way, it's categorical theory. It's really functorial. You just do this and things come by themselves if you do it right. And this is exactly what happened in algebraic geometry. And this was, was I think, it's interesting. And, but it may be illusion, of course. The similarity may be an illusion. Because we, yes, it's a, in our mind, we make things similar. Maybe I dissimilar, I don't know. I made this formulation personally, of course that sounds very similar. Right? Maybe it was kind of my cheating. Right? I don't know. No. They look very similar. I <laughs> put it this way, right? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? But, because, but again, in any way, regardless of what I say, these are two great theorems, and especially the theorem of Franks, I highly, highly advertise this as a remarkable theorem in its simplicity and universality yeah, and potential to, for generalization. I think it's a remarkable theorem. I think. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. There are no more questions. Thanks again. Thank you. Okay.